Chapter Four of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alouda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alouda Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African, written by himself. By Alouda Equiano. Chapter Four. The author is baptized, narrowly escapes drowning, goes on an expedition to the Mediterranean, incidents he met with there, is witness to an engagement between some English and French ships, a particular account of the celebrated engagement between Admiral Boscoen and Monsignor Le Clou off Cape Logas in August 1759, dreadful explosion of a French ship. The author sails for England. His master appointed to the command of a fire-ship. Meets a negro boy, from whom he experiences much benevolence. Prepares for an expedition against Belle Isle. A remarkable story of a disaster which befell his ship. Arrives at Belle Isle. Operations of the landing and siege. The author's danger and distress, with his manner of extricating himself. Surrender of Belle Isle. Transactions afterwards on the coast of France. Remarkable instance of kidnapping. The author returns to England, hears a talk of peace, and expects his freedom. His ship sails for Deptford to be paid off, and when he arrives there he is suddenly seized by his master, and carried forcibly on board a West India ship and sold. It was now between two and three years since I first came to England, a great part of which I had spent at sea so that I became inured to that service, and began to consider myself as happily situated, for my master treated me always extremely well, and my attachment and gratitude to him were very great. From the various scenes I had beheld on shipboard, I soon grew a stranger to terror of every kind, and was, in that respect at least, almost an Englishman. I have often reflected with surprise that I never felt half the alarm at any of the numerous dangers I have been in, that I was filled with at the first sight of the Europeans, and at every act of theirs, even the most trifling, when I first came among them, and for some time afterwards. That fear, however, which was the effect of my ignorance, wore away as I began to know them. I could now speak English tolerably well, and I perfectly understood everything that was said. I now not only felt myself quite easy with these new countrymen, but relished their society and manners. I no longer looked upon them as spirits, but as men superior to us, and therefore I had the stronger desire to resemble them, to imbibe their spirit, and imitate their manners. I therefore embraced every occasion of improvement, and every new thing that I observed I treasured up in my memory. I had long wished to be able to read and write, and for this purpose I took every opportunity to gain instruction, but had made as yet very little progress. However, when I went to London with my master, I had soon an opportunity of improving myself, which I gladly embraced. Shortly after my arrival he sent me to wait upon the Miss Garands, who had treated me with much kindness when I was there before, and they sent me to school. While I was attending these ladies their servants told me I could not go to heaven unless I was baptized. This made me very uneasy, for I had now some faint idea of a future state. Accordingly I communicated my anxiety to the eldest Miss Gorin, with whom I was become a favourite, and pressed her to have me baptised, when to my great joy she told me I should. She had formerly asked my master to let me be baptised, but he had refused. However, she now insisted on it, and he being under some obligation to her brother, complied with her request. So I was baptised in St. Margaret's Church, Westminster, in February 1759, by my present name. The clergyman at the same time gave me a book, called A Guide to the Indians, written by the Bishop of Sodor and Man. On this occasion Miss Guerin did me the honour to stand as godmother, and afterwards gave me a treat. I used to attend these ladies about the town, in which service I was extremely happy, as I had thus many opportunities of seeing London, which I desired of all things. I was sometimes, however, with my master at his rendezvous house, which was at the foot of Westminster Bridge. Here I used to enjoy myself in playing about the bridge-stairs, and often in the waterman's wearies with other boys. 
On one of these occasions there was another boy with me in a weary, and we went out into the current on the river. While we were there, two more stout boys came to us in another wherry, and abusing us for taking the boat, desired me to get into the other wherry boat. Accordingly, I went to get out of the wherry I was in, but just as I had got one of my feet into the other boat, the boys shoved it off so that I fell into the Thames, and not being able to swim, I should unavoidably have been drowned, but for the assistance of some watermen who providentially came to my relief. The Namur being again got ready for sea, my master with his gang was ordered on board, and, to my no small grief, I was obliged to leave my schoolmaster, whom I liked very much, and always attended while I stayed in London, to repair on board with my master. Nor did I leave my kind patronesses, the Miss Garans, without uneasiness and regret. They often used to teach me to read, and took great pains to instruct me in the principles of religion and the knowledge of God. I therefore parted from these amiable ladies with reluctance, after receiving from them many friendly cautions how to conduct myself, and some valuable presents. When I came to Spithead I found we were destined for the Mediterranean, with a large fleet, which was now ready to put to sea. We only waited for the arrival of the Admiral, who soon came on board, and about the beginning of the spring, 1759, having weighed anchor, and got under way, sailed for the Mediterranean and in eleven days from the land's end we got to Gibraltar. While we were here I used to be often on shore, and got various fruits in great plenty and very cheap. I had frequently told several people in my excursions on shore the story of my being kidnapped with my sister, and of our being separated, as I have related before. And I had as often expressed my anxiety for her fate, and my sorrow at having never met her again. One day, when I was on shore, and mentioning these circumstances to some persons, one of them told me he knew where my sister was, and if I would accompany him, he would bring me to her. Improbable as this story was, I believed it immediately, and agreed to go with him, while my heart leaped for joy, and, indeed, he conducted me to a black young woman, who was so like my sister, that at first sight I really thought it was her. But I was quickly undeceived, and on talking to her, I found her to be of another nation. While we lay here, the Preston came in from the Levant. As soon as she arrived, my master told me I should now see my old companion Dick, who had gone in her when she sailed for Turkey. I was much rejoiced at this news, and expected every minute to embrace him, and when the captain came on board of our ship, which he did immediately after, I ran to inquire after my friend, but with inexpressible sorrow I learned from the boat's crew that the dear youth was dead and that they had brought his chest and all his other things to my master. These he afterwards gave to me, and I regarded them as a memorial of my friend, whom I loved and grieved for as a brother. While we were at Gibraltar I saw a soldier hanging by his heels at one of the moles. Footnote. He had drowned himself in endeavouring to desert. I thought this a strange sight, as I had seen a man hanged in London by his neck. At another time I saw the master of a frigate towed to shore on a grating, by several of the men of war's boats, and discharged the fleet, which I understood was a mark of disgrace for cowardice. On board the same ship there was also a sailor, hung up at the yard-arm. After lying at Gibraltar for some time we sailed up the Mediterranean, a considerable way above the Gulf of Lyons, where we were one night overtaken by a terrible gale of wind much greater than any I had ever yet experienced. The sea ran so high that, though all the guns were well housed, there was great reason to fear their getting loose. The ship rolled so much, and if they had it must have proved our destruction. After we had cruised here for a short time we came to Barcelona, a Spanish seaport, remarkable for its silk manufactures. Here the ships were all to be watered, and my master, who spoke different languages, and used often to interpret for the admiral, superintended the watering of ours. For that purpose he and the officers of the other ships, who were on the same service, had tents pitched in the bay, and the Spanish soldiers were stationed along the shore, I suppose to see that no depredations were committed by our men. I used constantly to attend my master, and I was charmed with this place. All the time we stayed it was like a fair with the natives, who brought us fruits of all kinds, and sold them to us much cheaper than I got them in England. 
They used also to bring wine down to us in hog and sheepskins, which diverted me very much. The Spanish officers here treated our officers with great politeness and attention, and some of them, in particular, used to come often to my master's tent to visit him, where they would sometimes divert themselves by mounting me on the horses or mules, so that I could not fall, and setting them off at full gallop, my imperfect skill in horsemanship all the while affording them no small entertainment. After the ships were watered, we returned to our old station of cruising off Toulon, for the purpose of intercepting a fleet of French men of war that lay there. One Sunday in our cruise we came off a place where there were two small French frigates lying in shore, and our admiral, thinking to take or destroy them, sent two ships in after them, the Culloden and the Conqueror. They soon came up to the Frenchmen, and I saw a smart fight here, both by sea and land, for the frigates were covered by batteries, and they played upon our ships most furiously, which they as furiously returned, and for a long time a constant firing was kept up on all sides at an amazing rate. At last one frigate sunk, but the people escaped, though not without much difficulty, and a little after some of the people left the other frigate also, which was a mere wreck. However, our ships did not venture to bring her away. They were so much annoyed from the batteries, which raked them both in going and coming. Their topmasts were shot away, and they were otherwise so much shattered that the admiral was obliged to send in many boats to tow them back to the fleet. I afterwards sailed with a man who fought in one of the French batteries during the engagement, and he told me our ships had done considerable mischief that day, on shore and in the batteries. After this we sailed for Gibraltar, and arrived there about August 1759. Here we remained with all our sails unbent, while the fleet was watering and doing other necessary things. While we were in this situation, one day the admiral, with most of the principal officers and many people of all stations being on shore, about seven o'clock in the evening we were alarmed by signals from the frigates stationed for that purpose. And in an instant there was a general cry that the French fleet was out, and just passing through the straits. The admiral immediately came on board with some other officers, and it is impossible to describe the noise, hurry, and confusion throughout the whole fleet, in bending their sails and slipping their cables, Many people and ship's boats were left on shore in the bustle. We had two captains on board of our ship, who had come away in the hurry and left their ships to follow. We shewed lights from the gunwale to the main topmast head, and all our lieutenants were employed amongst the fleet to tell the ships not to wait for their captains, but to put the sails to the yards, slip their cables, and follow us, and in this confusion of making ready for fighting we set out for sea in the dark after the French fleet. Here I could have exclaimed with Ajax, O Jove, O Father, if it be thy will that we must perish, we thy will obey, but let us perish by the light of day. They had got the start of us so far that we were not able to come up with them during the night, but at daylight we saw seven sail of the line of battle some miles ahead. We immediately chased them till about four o'clock in the evening, when our ships came up with them, and though we were about fifteen large ships, our gallant admiral only fought them with his own division, which consisted of seven, so that we were just ship for ship. We passed by the whole of the enemy's fleet, in order to come up at their commander, Monsieur Laclou, who was in the ocean, an eighty-four-gun ship. As we passed they all fired on us, and at one time three of them fired together, continuing to do so for some time notwithstanding which our admiral would not suffer a gun to be fired at any of them, to my astonishment, but made us lie on our bellies on the deck till we came quite close to the ocean, which was ahead of them all, when we had orders to pour the whole three tiers into her at once. The engagement now commenced with great fury on both sides. The ocean immediately returned our fire, and we continued engaged with each other for some time, during which I was frequently stunned with the thundering of the great guns, whose dreadful contents hurried many of my companions into awful eternity. At last the French line was entirely broken, and we obtained the victory, which was immediately proclaimed with loud huzzas and acclamations. We took three prizes, La Modeste of sixty-four guns, and Le Temeraire and Centaur of seventy-four guns each. The rest of the French ships took to flight with all the sail they could crowd. Our ship being very much damaged and quite disabled from pursuing the enemy, the admiral immediately quitted her, 
and went in the broken and only boat we had left on board, the Newark, with which, and some other ships, he went after the French. The ocean, and another large French ship, called the Redoubtable, endeavouring to escape, ran ashore at Cape Logas, on the coast of Portugal, and the French admiral and some of the crew got ashore, but we, finding it impossible to get the ships off, set fire to them both. About midnight I saw the ocean blow up, with a most dreadful explosion. I never beheld a more awful scene. In less than a minute the midnight for a certain space seemed turned into day by the blaze, which was attended with a noise louder and more terrible than thunder, that seemed to rend every element around us. My station during the engagement was on the middle deck, where I was quartered with another boy to bring powder to the aftermost gun, and here I was a witness of the dreadful fate of many of my companions, who, in the twinkling of an eye, were dashed in pieces, and launched into eternity. Happily I escaped unhurt, though the shot and splinters flew thick about me during the whole fight. Towards the latter part of it my master was wounded, and I saw him carried down to the surgeon. But though I was much alarmed for him, and wished to assist him, I dared not leave my post. At this station my gunmate, a partner in bringing powder for the same gun, and I, ran a very great risk for more than half an hour of blowing up the ship. For, when we had taken the cartridges out of the boxes, the bottoms of many of them proving rotten, the powder ran all about the deck, near the match-tub. We scarcely had water enough at the last to throw on it. We were also, from our employment, very much exposed to the enemy's shots, for we had to go through nearly the whole length of the ship to bring the powder. I expected therefore every minute to be my last, especially when I saw our men fall so thick about me. But, wishing to guard as much against the dangers as possible, at first I thought it would be safest not to go for the powder till the Frenchmen had fired their broadside, and then, while they were charging, I could go and come with my powder. But immediately afterwards I thought this caution was fruitless, and cheering myself with the reflection that there was a time allotted for me to die as well as to be born, I instantly cast off all fear or thought whatever of death, and went through the whole of my duty with alacrity, pleasing myself with the hope, if I survived the battle, of relating it and the dangers I had escaped to the dear Miss Guerin and others when I should return to London. Our ship suffered very much in this engagement, for besides the number of our killed and wounded she was almost torn to pieces, and our rigging so much shattered that our mizzenmast and mainyard, etc., hung over the side of the ship so that we were obliged to get many carpenters, and others from some of the ships of the fleet, to assist in setting us in some tolerable order. And, notwithstanding, it took us some time before we were completely refitted, after which we left Admiral Broderick to command, and we, with the prizes, steered for England. On the passage, and as soon as my master was something recovered of his wounds, the Admiral appointed him captain of the Etna fire-ship, on which he and I left the Namur, and went on board of her at sea. I liked this little ship very much. I now became the captain's steward, in which situation I was very happy, for I was extremely well treated by all on board, and I had leisure to improve myself in reading and writing. The latter I had learned a little of before I left the Namur, as there was a school on board. When we arrived at Spithead, the Etna went into Portsmouth Harbour to refit, which, being done, we returned to Spithead and joined a large fleet that was thought to be intended against the Havana but about that time the king died. Whether that prevented the expedition I know not, but it caused our ship to be stationed at Cowes, in the Isle of Wight, till the beginning of the year sixty-one. Here I spent my time very pleasantly. I was much on shore all about this delightful island, and found the inhabitants very civil. While I was here I met with a trifling incident, which surprised me agreeably. I was one day in a field blowing to a gentleman who had a black boy about my own size. This boy, having observed me from his master's house, was transported at the sight of one of his own countrymen, and ran to meet me with utmost haste. I, not knowing what he was about, turned a little out of his way at first, but to no purpose. He soon came close to me, and caught hold of me in his arms, as if I had been his brother, though we had never seen each other before. After we had talked together for some time, he took me to his master's house, where I was treated very kindly. This benevolent boy and I were very happy in frequently seeing each other till about the month of March, 1761, when our ship had orders to fit out again for another expedition. When we got ready, we joined a very large fleet at Spithead, 
commanded by Commodore Keppel, which was destined against Belle Isle, and with a number of transport ships with troops on board, to make a descent on the place. We sailed once more in quest of fame. I longed to engage in new adventures and see fresh wonders. I had a mind on which everything uncommon made its full impression, and every event which I considered as marvellous, every extraordinary escape or signal deliverance, either of myself or others, I looked upon to be effected by the interposition of Providence. We had not been above ten days at sea before an incident of this kind happened, which, whatever credit it may obtain from the reader, made no small impression on my mind. We had on board a gunner, whose name was John Mondel, a man of very indifferent morals. This man's cabin was between the decks, exactly over where I lay abreast of the quarter-deck ladder. One night, the 20th of April, being terrified with a dream, he awoke in so great a fright that he could not rest in his bed any longer, nor even remain in his cabin, and he went upon deck about four o'clock in the morning, extremely agitated. He immediately told those on deck of the agonies of his mind, and the dream which occasioned it, in which he said he had seen many things very awful, and had been warned by St. Peter to repent, who told him time was short. This, he said, had greatly alarmed him, and he was determined to alter his life. People generally mock the fears of others when they are themselves in safety, and some of his shipmates who heard him only laughed at him. However, he made a vow that he never would drink strong liquors again and he immediately got a light, and gave away his sea-stores of liquor. After which, his agitation still continuing, he began to read the scriptures, hoping to find some relief, and soon afterwards he laid himself down again on his bed, and endeavoured to compose himself to sleep, but to no purpose, his mind still continuing in a state of agony. By this time it was exactly half after seven in the morning. I was then under the half-deck at the great cabin door, and all at once I heard the people in the waist cry out most fearfully, The Lord have mercy upon us! We are all lost! The Lord have mercy upon us! Mr. Mondel, hearing the cries, immediately ran out of his cabin, and we were instantly struck by the Lynn, a forty-gun ship, Captain Clark, which nearly ran us down. This ship had just put about, and was by the wind, but had not got full headway, or we must all have perished, for the wind was brisk. However, before Mr. Mondel, had got four steps from his cabin door, she struck our ship with her cutwater right in the middle of his bed and cabin, and ran it up to the combings of the quarter-deck hatchway, and above three feet below water. And in a minute there was not a bit of wood to be seen where Mr. Mondel's cabin stood, and he was so near being killed that some of the splinters tore his face. As Mr. Mondel must inevitably have perished from this accident, had he not been alarmed in the very extraordinary way I have related. I could not help regarding this as an awful interposition of Providence for his preservation. The two ships for some time swinged alongside of each other, for ours being a fire-ship our grappling irons caught the lynn every way, and the yards and rigging went at an astonishing rate. Our ship was in such a shocking condition that we all thought she would instantly go down, and every one ran for their lives, and got as well as they could on board the lynn, but our lieutenant, being the aggressor, he never quitted the ship. However, when we found she did not sink immediately, the captain came on board again, and encouraged our people to return and try to save her. Many on this came back, but some would not venture. Some of the ships in the fleet, seeing our situation, immediately sent their boats to our assistance, but it took us the whole day to save the ship with all their help. And by using every possible means, particularly frapping her together with many housers, and putting a great quantity of tallow below water, where she was damaged, she was kept together. But it was well we did not meet with any gales of wind, or we must have gone to pieces, for we were in such a crazy condition that we had ships to attend us till we arrived at Belle Isle, the place of our destination, and then we had all things taken out of the ship, and she was properly repaired. This escape of Mr. Mondo, which he, as well as myself, always considered as a singular act of providence, I believe, had a great influence on his life and conduct ever afterwards. Now that I am on this subject, I beg leave to relate another instance or two which strongly raised my belief of the particular interposition of heaven, and which might not otherwise have found a place here, from their insignificance. I belonged for a few days in the year 1758 to the Jason of fifty-four guns at Plymouth, 
and one night, when I was on board, a woman with a child at her breast fell from the upper deck down into the hold, near the keel. Everyone thought that the mother and child must be both dashed to pieces, but to our great surprise neither of them was hurt. I myself one day fell headlong from the upper deck of the Etna down the afterhold, when the ballast was out, and all who saw me fall cried out that I was killed, but I received not the least injury. And in the same ship a man fell from the masthead on the deck without being hurt. In these, and in many more instances, I thought I could plainly trace the hand of God, without whose permission a sparrow cannot fall. I began to raise my fear from man to him alone, and to call daily on his holy name with fear and reverence, and I trust he heard my supplications, and graciously condescended to answer me according to his holy word, and to implant the seeds of piety in me, even one of the meanest of his creatures. When we had refitted our ship, and all things were in readiness for attacking the place, the troops on board the transports were ordered to disembark, and my master, as a junior captain, had a share in the command of the landing. This was on the 8th of April. The French were drawn up on the shore, and had made every disposition to oppose the landing of our men, only a small part of them this day being able to effect it. Most of them, after fighting with great bravery, were cut off, and General Crawford, with a number of others, were taken prisoners. In this day's engagement we had also our lieutenant killed. On the 21st of April we renewed our efforts to land the men, while all the men of war were stationed along the shore to cover it and fired at the French batteries and breastworks from early in the morning till about four o'clock in the evening, when our soldiers effected a safe landing. They immediately attacked the French, and, after a sharp encounter, forced them from the batteries. Before the enemy retreated they blew up several of them, lest they should fall into our hands. Our men now proceeded to besiege the citadel, and my master was ordered on shore to superintend the landing of all the materials necessary for carrying on the siege in which service I mostly attended him. While I was there, I went about to different parts of the island, and one day, particularly, my curiosity almost cost me my life. I wanted very much to see the mode of charging the mortars and letting off the shells, and for that purpose I went to an English battery that was but a very few yards from the walls of the citadel. There, indeed, I had an opportunity of completely gratifying myself in seeing the whole operation, and that not without running a very great risk, both from the English shells that burst while I was there, but likewise from those of the French. One of the largest of their shells bursted within nine or ten yards of me. There was a single rock close by, about the size of a butt, and I got instant shelter under it in time to avoid the fury of the shell. Where it burst, the earth was torn in such a manner that two or three butts might easily have gone into the hole it made, and it threw great quantities of stones and dirt to a considerable distance. Three shot were also fired at me and another boy who was along with me. One of them in particular seemed winged with red lightning and impetuous rage, for with a most dreadful sound it hissed close by me and struck a rock at a little distance, which it shattered to pieces. When I saw what perilous circumstances I was in, I attempted to return the nearest way I could find, and thereby I got between the English and the French sentinels. An English sergeant, who commanded the outposts, seeing me, and surprised how I came there, which was by stealth along the seashore, reprimanded me very severely for it, and instantly took the sentinel off his post into custody, for his negligence in suffering me to pass the lines. While I was in this situation I observed at a little distance a French horse, belonging to some islanders, which I thought I would now mount, for the greater expedition of getting off. Accordingly I took some cord which I had about me, and making a kind of bridle of it, I put it round the horse's head, and the tame beast very quietly suffered me to tie him thus and mount him. As soon as I was on the horse's back, I began to kick and beat him, and try every means to make him go quick, but all to very little purpose. I could not drive him out of a slow pace. While I was creeping along, still within reach of the enemy's shot, I met with a servant well mounted on an English horse. I immediately stopped and crying told him my case, and begged of him to help me, and this he effectually did. For having a fine large whip, he began to lash my horse with it so severely that he set off full speed with me towards the sea, while I was quite unable to hold or manage him. In this manner I went along till I came to a craggy precipice. I now could not stop my horse, and my mind was filled with apprehensions 
of my deplorable fate should he go down the precipice, which he appeared fully disposed to do. I therefore thought I had better throw myself off him at once, which I did immediately with a great deal of dexterity, and fortunately escaped unhurt. As soon as I found myself at liberty, I made the best of my way for the ship, determined I would not be so foolhardy again in a hurry. We continued to besiege the citadel till June, when it surrendered. During the siege I have counted above sixty shells and carcasses in the air at once. When this place was taken I went through the citadel, and in the bomb-proofs under it which were cut in the solid rock, and I thought it a surprising place, both for strength and building, notwithstanding which our shots and shells had made amazing devastation, and ruinous heaps all around it. After the taking of this island our ships, with some others, commanded by Commodore Stanhope and the Swiftshore, went to Bass Road, where we blocked up a French fleet. Our ships were there from June till February following, and in that time I saw a great many scenes of war, and stratagems on both sides to destroy each other's fleet. Sometimes we would attack the French with some ships of the line, at other times with boats, and frequently we made prizes. Once or twice the French attacked us by throwing shells with their bomb vessels, and one day, as a French vessel was throwing shells at our ships, she broke from her springs, behind the isle of Ida Re. The tide being complicated, she came within a gunshot of the Nassau, but the Nassau could not bring a gun to bear upon her, and thereby the Frenchmen got off. We were twice attacked by their fire-floats, which they chained together, and then let them float down with the tide, but each time we sent boats with grapplings, and towed them safe out of the fleet. We had different commanders while we were at this place, Commodore Stanhope, Dennis, Lord Howe, etc. From hence, before the Spanish war began, our ship and the wasp sloop were sent to St. Sebastian in Spain by Commodore Stanhope, and Commodore Dennis afterwards sent our ship as a cartel to Bayonne in France. Footnote. Among others whom we brought from Bayonne, two gentlemen who had been in the West Indies, where they sold slaves, and they confessed they had made at one time a false bill of sale, and sold two Portuguese white men among a lot of slaves. After which, note, some people have it, that sometimes shortly before persons die, their ward has been seen, that is, some spirit exactly in their likeness, though they are themselves at other places at the same time. One day, while we were at Bayonne, Mr. Mondel saw one of our men, as he thought, in the gun-room, and a little after, coming to the quarter-deck, he spoke of some circumstances of this man to some of the officers. They told him that the man was then out of the ship, in one of the boats with the lieutenant, but Mr. Mondel would not believe it, and we searched the ship, when he found the man was actually out of her, and when the boat returned some time afterwards, we found the man had been drowned at the very time Mr. Mondel thought he saw him. We went in February in 1762 to Belle Isle, and there stayed till the summer when we left it and returned to Portsmouth. After our ship was fitted out again for service, in September she went to Guernsey, where I was very glad to see my old hostess, who was now a widow, and my former little charming companion, her daughter. I spent some time here very happily with them, till October, when we had orders to repair to Portsmouth. We parted from each other with a great deal of affection, and I promised to return soon and see them again, not knowing what all-powerful fate had determined for me. Our ship having arrived at Portsmouth, we went into the harbour, and remained there till the latter part of November. When we heard great talk about peace, and, to our very great joy, in the beginning of December we had orders to go up to London with our ship to be paid off. We received this news with loud huzzas, and every other demonstration of gladness, and nothing but mirth was to be seen throughout every part of the ship. I, too, was not without my share of the general joy on this occasion. I thought now of nothing but being freed, and working for myself, and thereby getting money to enable me to get a good education for I always had a great desire to be able at least to read and write, and while I was on shipboard I had endeavoured to improve myself in both. While I was in the Etna particularly, the captain's clerk taught me to write, and gave me a smattering of arithmetic as far as the rule of three. There was also one Daniel Queen, about forty years of age, a man very well educated, who messed with me on board this ship, and he likewise dressed and attended the captain. Fortunately this man soon became very much attached to me, 
and took very great pains to instruct me in many things. He taught me to shave and dress hair a little, and also to read in the Bible, explaining many passages to me, which I did not comprehend. I was wonderfully surprised to see the laws and rules of my country written almost exactly here, a circumstance which I believe tended to impress our manners and customs more deeply on my memory. I used to tell him of this resemblance, and many a time we have sat up the whole night together at this employment. In short, he was like a father to me, and some even used to call me after his name. They also styled me the Black Christian. Indeed, I almost loved him with the affection of a son. Many things I have denied myself that he might have them, and when I used to play at marbles or any other game, and won a few halfpence, or got any little money, which I sometimes did, for shaving any one, I used to buy him a little sugar or tobacco, as far as my stock of money would go. He used to say that he and I never should part, and that when our ship was paid off, as I was as free as himself, or any other man on board, he would instruct me in his business, by which I might gain a good livelihood. This gave me new life and spirits, and my heart burned within me, while I thought the time long till I obtained my freedom. For though my master had not promised it to me, yet, besides the assurances I had received that he had no right to detain me, he always treated me with the greatest kindness, and reposed in me an unbounded confidence. He even paid attention to my morals, and would never suffer me to deceive him or tell lies, of which he used to tell me the consequences, and that if I did so God would not love me, so that, from all this tenderness, I had never once supposed, in all my dreams of freedom, that he would think of detaining me any longer than I wished. In pursuance of our orders we sailed from Portsmouth for the Thames, and arrived at Deptford the 10th of December, where we cast anchor just as it was high water. The ship was up about half an hour, when my master ordered the barge to be manned, and all in an instant, without having before given me the least reason to suspect anything of the matter, he forced me into the barge, saying, I was going to leave him, but he would take care I should not. I was so struck with the unexpectedness of this proceeding, that for some time I did not make a reply, only I made an offer to go for my books and chest of clothes, but he swore I should not move out of his sight and if I did he would cut my throat, at the same time taking his hanger. I began, however, to collect myself, and plucking up courage I told him I was free, and he could not by law serve me so. But this only enraged him the more, and he continued to swear, and said he would soon let me know whether he would or not, and at that instant sprung himself into the barge from the ship, to the astonishment and sorrow of all on board. The tide, rather unluckily for me, had just turned downward, so that we quickly fell down the river along with it, till we came among some outward-bound West India men, for he was resolved to put me on board the first vessel he could get to receive me. The boat's crew, who pulled against their will, became quite faint different times, and would have gone ashore, but he would not let them. Some of them strove then to cheer me, and told me he could not sell me, and that they would stand by me, which revived me a little, and I still entertained hopes for as they pulled along he asked some vessels to receive me, but they could not. But just as we had got a little below Gravesend, we came alongside of a ship which was going away the next tide for the West Indies. Her name was the Charming Sally, Captain James Duran, and my master went on board and agreed with him for me, and in a little time I was sent for into the cabin. When I came there, Captain Duran asked me if I knew him. I answered that I did not. Then he said, You are now my slave. I told him my master could not sell me to him, nor to any one else. Why, said he, did not your master buy you? I confessed he did. But I have served him, said I, many years, and he has taken all my wages and prize money, for I only got one sixpence during the war. Besides this I have been baptized, and by the laws of the land no man has a right to sell me. And I added, that I had heard a lawyer and others at different times tell my master so. They both then said that those people who told me so were not my friends. But I replied, it was very extraordinary that other people did not know the law as well as they. Upon this Captain Duran said I talked too much English, and if I did not behave myself well and be quiet, he had a method on board to make me. I was too well convinced of his power over me to doubt what he said, 
and my former sufferings in the slave-ship presenting themselves to my mind, the recollection of them made me shudder. However, before I retired, I told them that as I could not get my right among men here, I hoped I should hereafter in heaven, and I immediately left the cabin, filled with resentment and sorrow. The only coat I had with me my master took away with him, and said if my prize-money had been ten thousand pounds, he had a right to it all, and would have taken it. I had about nine guineas, which during my long seafaring life I had scraped together from trifling perquisites and little ventures, and I hid it that instant, lest my master should take that from me likewise, still hoping that by some means or other I should make my escape to the shore. And indeed some of my old shipmates told me not to despair, for they would get me back again, and that, as soon as they could get their pay, they would immediately come to Portsmouth to me, where the ship was going. But, alas, all my hopes were baffled, and the hour of my deliverance was yet far off. My master, having soon concluded his bargain with the captain, came out of the cabin, and he and his people got into the boat and put off. I followed them with aching eyes as long as I could, and when they were out of sight I threw myself on the deck, while my heart was ready to burst with sorrow and anguish. End of chapter 4